Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Janet. Yeah. I also do want to say, uh, uh, Dave and April, Dave was thanking all the people. We just want to thank you guys. Amen. Just the time and the scripture, the time and the word of God together, the fellowship. And we also do want to not only welcome everybody here, but the folks that have been listening on the internet. That's kind of cool. Yeah. 14 and, right now. Yeah. And it's Sunday morning. Uh, let's see. Yep, you uh, had it. Is, is the sound okay? Let's check the sound at this point. Can y'all hear that or not? Yeah. Yes or no? Can y'all hear it? Well, I can't hear it. In the back? Y'all can hear that okay? Seems like loud. I'm going to assume that that's okay. Last night there was 82 people. 82. Yeah. Wow. Oh. Oh. That's great. Yes. Uh, dur during all the breaks, uh, we've had some great conversations. Yes. I, I, I trust that everybody has uh, benefited from the time, not only to get to meet new people, maybe mm -hmm. some people that are in your area or not too far yeah. from your area. And that you can get together frequently throughout the year to study the Word of God uh, together. Sometimes people feel like, well, there, there's no one in the area, or even if they, if there were maybe two or three more people, then can we get together and have ministry? Yes. If, if you got, you not only can get together and have a Bible study at your house and that type of thing, or maybe at a hotel or whatever, but now with so many different uh, grace pastors and ministries online, or none, I mean. You can find a lot of bad stuff on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> wow, you can find a lot of good stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. There are a lot of great preachers on YouTube and, and they're on their Facebook page and that type of thing. So a lot of different access uh, points to get together and study the Word of God. Now, with that in mind, and as Dave mentioned earlier, that each year when we try to put the conference themes together, the topics, we try to get a feel for not only where, where really where Christianity as a whole is, but more in particular where, where the grace groups are at doctrinally. Yes. And of course everybody's at different places doctrinally in terms of their understanding and appreciation. But there are some foundational issues that are critical. And one of them is the Bible issue. Yeah. The Bible issue about the King James Bible. Oh, yeah. And so with that in mind, let me just ask the question, how many of y'all would uh, be interested and feel like it would be helpful if we put together maybe, maybe next year's conference or one of the conferences and focus specifically throughout the weekend, the theme being the Bible issue and specifically about the King James Bible. How many of y'all feel like that there would be a real benefit with that particular thing? Mm -hmm. and, and in talking with that issue, about that issue, of course, you'd be looking at the doctrine of inspiration, mm -hmm. preservation, but in particular, and also, therefore, translation. How do you, how does infallibility and inerrancy carry forward when you go from, say, the Hebrew to the English and the mm -hmm. Greek to the English? And is that even valid? Mm -hmm. Things like that. So if you think that that would be um, profitable, by the way, it is something that, 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 frankly, without the Bible, none of us need anything. Right, right. Mm -hmm. if, if you don't have the Word of God this entire weekend, it's just a total waste of time. Absolutely. If you didn't have the Word of God, if you don't have the perfect, infallible, inerrant Word of God, if it doesn't exist in the actual book that you can hold in your hand, and in our language, it does exist in your King James Bible. Okay, it does. It is in other languages, but in our language, it does exist in your King James Bible, the infallible, inerrant uh, Word of God. But think about it. If, if, he, if the Word of God doesn't exist in an in infallible, inerrant form, in infallible and an inerrant form, if it only existed in an infallible and an errant form in the original autographs, how can that mean anything to me and you today when no one has the original autographs? It's a completely irrelevant and meaningless statement when people say that well, we believe the scriptures were infallible in the original autographs. <laughs> <laughs> I, I told myself last night and asked, asked the Lord, so I'll tell you too. So, this is lesson one from next year's conference? It, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I was chiding myself last night, appropriately so, on the way back, because.
is not uh, something that I said, but how I said it. Oh. And if I could have said it different, I would. But at any rate, y'all can figure out that. Go listen to the message last time. <laughs> okay. At any rate, so I, I, I always told myself, you know, John, just calm down, would you? Sometimes <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to calm down when you do. Anyway, so my point is this, <laughs> that with a statement like, well, we believe the Bible to be the infallible and you know, in the airport of God in the original autographs. What's wrong with that statement? We don't have them. It, it don't don't have it. It's a completely meaningless statement. Mm -hmm. It's a total fraud of a statement. When you when you look at people's doctrinal statements and so forth, oftentimes the very first statement is something along those lines. But then really what does that say about all the other statements that they're making? If, if you don't have the infallible, inerrant word of God that you can actually possess in your hand, then you have no final authority. We were, we were talking about, you mentioned the pastor at the church that y'all were going to, that you asked him, do you believe the word of God is the infallible and the final authority? And of course, they'll all say yes, except when they don't. Except when they put it in your hand. Yeah, you ask them, can you put it in my hand? Well, no. And then they get on your case where, where you're just a troublemaker because you believe the word of God is just in your hand. Give a sermon with four different versions. Or give a sermon from four different yeah, versions, four different right? Versions. To make yeah. the point. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. Lord, okay, my wife's over there. She's clearly got to say something. And it's, it'll be good, I promise oh, you. No. <laughs> no, I was just saying that if people want not to wait till next year, you're doing that series at church and you can find it on hybridwithyourjoy.com. Yeah, we're doing a series right oh. now about translation oh. and the legitimacy of translation from Hebrew to any other language for that matter, but in particular Hebrew to English. So, but, yeah. See, she always got good Yeah, plug it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's funny because, uh, can, can I tell a quick story? Teacher prerogative. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> we, we do the Zoom studies, and the people on Zoom will notice that, that uh, we do the Zoom studies Tuesday night at 7, Wednesday night at 7, and then, and then Saturday at 5 p.m. And then, of course, we have the, the live uh, YouTube broadcast on Sunday morning services. And whenever I'm done with the lesson, we always open it up for questions, always. And people will just raise their hand or whatever. And it's a great question in there. And the only time that I'm afraid is when my wife waits for <laughs> <laughs> and, and of course, as soon as her hand goes up, I say, okay, time to close and pray. Will you just send me a note? <laughs> I, that's, I, I need to text her and say, now, before you ask the question, text me the question. <laughs> Well, we have a wonderful time. All of us, don't we have a wonderful time in the scripture together? Yes. yes. We really do encourage questions. Uh, John gave me a whole stack of questions. Great questions, by the way, John Barright. Get, get, uh, gave me a whole stack of questions after the Q&A session. Oh, yeah. wow. <laughs> That's great, though. That's just great stuff, you know, so. All right, having said that, let's, uh, let's begin with the word of prayer today. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for the time that we've been able to spend this whole weekend in your word, especially focusing on the idea of how to, how to make decisions in the light of the dispensation of grace where we live. And we thank you for all that which we have learned and will now learn in this next message. And then we thank you for the fact that however much longer this dispensation of grace lasts, that each and every day is a day to make decisions. And to do so in the light of your wise counsel, in the light of your wisdom that you have disclosed to us too, through the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Father, we all unite our hearts together. You, you tell us to let a request be made known unto you. And, and as Dave mentioned here earlier about Pastor Jordan and Cynthia, we sure miss them that they weren't able to be here this year. And yet it was certainly for a worthy cause and the reason that they weren't able to be here. We pray for him and his ministry. We pray for, for Mary, whose husband went home to be with the Lord completely unexpectedly, and her, her three daughters. And for their ministry, because this no doubt was a, a hit on the ministry out there. Not that Satan did this or that he did this, but it just is. And so we certainly rejoice together with the fact that Lou is with you. And, and as all the saints there do, they, they rejoice in the fact that Lou is with you. And yet, it's always hard to say goodbye. And yet, we'll see him again. And you instructed us through the Apostle Paul that while we might sorrow, 
it was we don't sorrow as those that have no hope because our hope is a sure hope because it's the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you in Christ. Wonderful. Amen. 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 I'm going to have you open your Bibles to uh, Romans chapter 12 here. Romans chapter number 12. And what we are going to do, we're going to try to be as efficient as possible with, with the time in here to get all this stuff in. And I think I, I know I can speak for Dave and for Dean that all of us when we get up there, there's just a lot of information to try to go over. So it's, it's oftentimes what happens is you, you just have to whittle down and say, what can I leave out and not say? What yeah. can I leave out and not say it? To try to be efficient here. So all of these particular lessons, all these, these specific lessons, each and every one of us here, you can all go back and study further on your own and fill in a lot of details that we just weren't able to get to here. So if you look with me over to uh, Romans chapter 12, and as I asked you last night, everybody uh, yesterday and then uh, to, to get a piece of paper, write some things down. So what were the two words I asked you to write on top of your piece of paper? Abba Father. Okay, so we're going to start there, okay? So always, always, from now on, if you have not thought this before, from now on, always think about your relationship to God in those two terms, those two words, my Abba Father, my Abba Father, right? Yeah. Yeah. What did, what did Dean just say? The, what, right before you said Jesus, what was the word? I said thank God. And you said sweet, sweet Jesus. Sweet. Isn't uh -huh. that wonderful? Mm -hmm. Just to know that. So whenever you think about your relationship to the Father, think of it, my Abba Father. Direct line. What's that? Direct line. Okay, direct line. So access, unbroken access. Right? My dear Abba Father. The, the, the lover of your soul. Uh, no one, that's, how's that song say? No one ever cared for me like Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. well, how true that is. So as we're making decisions, you're making it in the presence of the one who is the lover of your soul, the one who cares about you. He's not to condemn you. He just loves you. And with the same fact, let me ask you, how much does God love you? According to the riches of his grace. According to the riches. Of, yeah, they say this much. Well, maybe more. <laughs> How much does he love you? The east to the west. He loves Jesus. Looking up to give his son to die for He loves you as much as he loves Christ. So I guess actually bigger than that, right? <laughs> so, but but he does. He loves he loves you with the love that he has towards the Lord Jesus Christ. And in order for us to be separated, are you in Romans twelve, right? Yeah. Go, go back to Romans eight. Romans eight here. <laughs> Look at Romans 8, verse 38 and 39. And read these two verses out loud with me. He says, For I am persuaded that neither death, death nor life, nor, nor, nor angels, angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is where? In Christ Jesus. So where is the love of God located? In Christ Jesus. And where are you located? In Christ Jesus. So in order for you to be separated from the love of God, what would first have to happen? Get out of Christ. God would have to quit loving Christ. Or we'd have to quit loving it has nothing to do with your love for God. Oh. Nothing. Let me ask, uh, let me say it this way. By the way, when I say that, I, I, I'm not going no. against you. You understand that. I don't, I don't mean to come across as No, we didn't. You know, we didn't. Yeah, yeah. But, but it, but, no, no, no. The love of God towards you has nothing to do with your love for him. Right. Our love right. for him. Yeah. Our, our love, do y'all know what a roller coaster is? Yeah. 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 What? A, roller coaster. a roller coaster. Oh. Other than life. What's a roller coaster? Yeah. <laughs> a ride. And, and what does it do? It goes up and down. It goes up and down and makes you scream and laugh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it makes you sick. <laughs> well, if, if you, when we think about our fidelity, our love for God, it's the roller coaster. Right? So that's why we want to be real 
careful not to associate and link and connect God's love towards us in any way being equal to or measured by our love to him. See that there? So I, I, I'm not trying to call you no, out. No, no, it's okay. It, it's, God's love for you is derived, is, is, is tied directly to his love for Christ. Which is steady. And so in order for God to, to change his love for you, he would first have to change his love for Christ. Which, is you know, which can never happen. Right? right. And the proof of God's love, God commended his love towards us, us in that while we were yes. sinners. Yes. Yes. Well, when we didn't love him, right. when we didn't care about him, when we wanted nothing to do with him, stay out of my life, I can be my own God. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Yep. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So to know the extent of God's love and to know how real it is. It just that's why his love constraints compels draws us. Isn't that wonderful? Now, go with me. So so the nature of the relationship, ah the father, the, the, the lover of your soul, when it comes to making decisions and living life, we're in that kind of a relationship with him. How often is God going to be mad at you for a bad or wrong decision? Never. Why would you say no? Because we're in Christ. You're in Christ, and this is the relationship. You've got a different kind of question. How often is, this is not a trick question, don't <laughs> answer too quickly, but maybe answer quickly, okay. Um, how often is God disappointed at you for making a bad or wrong decision? Never. Never. Okay, interesting, you never. Why never? He sees us in his son. Doesn't he already know every decision we're going to make? Yes. yes. So the concept, the idea that he's going to be disappointed suggests that he expected, expected something different out of us beyond what he knew we were going to do. How often are you disappointed with you? How often am I disappointed with you? Yeah. <laughs> Daily. There is a sense, however, in which that just proved to me, when I'm disappointed with me, it just proved to me that I had unrealistic expectations about my own flesh. <laughs> Great point. Right? Right. So. What about grieving the Holy Spirit? What's that? Mean? What about grieving the Great Holy Spirit? Great question. The Apostle Paul yes. uses a couple of phrases. He says, quench not the Spirit. He says, grieve not the Spirit. What's the Spirit's function? Great question. Thanks for bringing that up. That's really good. Um, and, and that will actually tie in with the decision making process but what is the what's the Holy Spirit doing in our life yes he sealed us circumcised us he's leading us he's leading us there you go yeah, he's leading us through the word of God right through the Bible there you go yeah the way the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit is how through the word of God okay the Holy Spirit today is going to say the same thing that he said yesterday about our being accepted in Christ. So to quench, to, to, if I quench a thirst, what am I doing? I'm, I'm putting it out, right? right? So I'll illustrate what it means to either quench the Spirit or grieve the Holy Spirit. I'm going to illustrate. Everybody look up here, watch this. Okay, so I'm, I'm coming to the Bible, I'm trying to figure out something to do and everything, and I read the verse. Yeah. What did I just do? Grieve the Holy Spirit. I, I stopped. Yeah, I, I, I read the verse and I didn't like it. Who said that? I didn't like what it said. <laughs> she must be married. No, but anyway. Oh, it be a long ride home. Good job, John. And she's got, by the way, she's got a good man right there. Yeah. And he's got a good name, too. <laughs> So the idea of quench not the spirit, Paul says to the Thessalonians there, uh, despise not prophesying, quench not the spirit. They, the idea of prophesying there, they, they were speaking the word of God and so forth, not in a sense of Isaiah or Malachi, but, but mm. then giving information to them, right? So in that context, he says to the Thessalonians, don't, don't close your ears to the teaching of God's word. So the concern with the Thessalonians when he says quench, he says this in verse. 
Can I grab, grab a trail for five yes, minutes? Yes, yeah. Course. Maybe 10, no, okay, five. Okay. <laughs> that means I get to add five. Yeah. I have the building all day. Thank you. My <laughs> <laughs> intervention, right? Think about first and second Thessalonians. In first Thessalonians, does the Apostle Paul make it very, very clear that the coming of Christ for the body of Christ is prior to the resumption of the prophecy program. Yes. yes. That is, we would right. say pre trip yes. We would say, and so when you come to 1 Thessalonians 4, we're going to be caught up together. Mm -hmm. Chapter 5. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need to write to you, for you know perfectly well that the day of the Lord shall come as a thief in the night, and you're not of the night. Right. right. You're, not, you're of the day of grace, you're not of the night. So 1 Thessalonians 4, he makes it very, very clear that the church, the body of Christ, is not going through the tribulation period. Right. In chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians, that's when he says, It's not the Spirit, despise not prophesying, prophesying means plural, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. What happened that caused him to write 2 Thessalonians? It didn't do that. A false letter. It shook him up. Which tells you that in order for that false letter to have the impact on the Thessalonians that Satan designed for that false letter to have on them, it even has the forgery as though Paul wrote it. Fake news. That happened. Fake news back then. Fake news. Fake news. Fake news. Fake news. Yeah. But that tells you, when he says, he, he warned them in 1 Thessalonians to be prepared for this false teaching about mixing and blending the two dispensations, specifically about the hope. So they got that false letter, and even though it had, Paul, it had a signature on it that looked like Paul's signature, those within the local assembly at Thessalonica who had the, the supernatural gift of identifying the word of God, they failed, or the saints at Thessalonica didn't listen to them. The point is, they read that false letter, they believed the false letter, even though the false letter clearly contradicted what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians. Right. That's an example of how they quenched the spirit mm. and how they failed to Prove all things and the whole fast that which is good. They knew 1 Thessalonians was from Paul, for sure. So this false letter comes in, and they simply should have laid them out side by side. 1 Thessalonians and the false letter. They should have laid them out side by side and said, wait, this is what Paul taught us. Point, 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 point. This letter says the day of the Lord is at hand, the day of Christ is at hand, so, we, so we're going through the tribulation period. Paul says we're not, this letter says way off. What, by faith, could they and should they have done? Rejected. They should be calling out that false letter. Everybody got the picture there? Yeah. No, back on track. Anyway, so the idea of quenching the spirit, greed, not the Holy Spirit of God, it's in relationship to our response to the scripture. We want to maintain an open, hungry heart to scripture. That doesn't mean you just accept everything. You be a Berean. You listen, but you check it out, yeah. right? You go back and study it. And then ask more questions. Then go back and study it. Then ask more questions. Go back and study it. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. That took more than five minutes, so can I add all? <laughs> <laughs> all right, now, where were we? We were talking about a relationship to God, Abba, Father. So as we talk about decision-making, today we're going to focus especially on how do you make decisions when when there's not a specific statement in Scripture about the issue you're facing. Last night we talked about decisions when the decisions are already made. Remember that? Yeah. Um, so how many of us should be involved in idolatry? Well, why? Well, because the decision's already made. And God, God tells us why. Okay? How many of us should be involved in bickering and hatred and division? Because those decisions are already made. So, so we, by faith, we, because of who we are in Christ, because of our relationship to God the Father, we hear his counsel, his wisdom, and we say, okay, I'm, I'm, 
his counsel is this, so I'm going to walk by faith in that. See that? But there are whole categories of decisions related to topics that aren't necessarily specifically addressed in Scripture and or... Let me give you an example. You're in Romans 12 there? Look at Romans 12. We're going to come back to verse 1 and 2 in a moment. Look at Romans 12, 18. Look at Romans 12, 18. Romans 12, 18, it says this. If it be possible... Stop right there. <laughs> Isn't that kind of a strange thing for the final authority to say about anything? Yeah. I mean, I thought, I thought everything's black and white. Oh, no. They put a movie out about that, the idea of don't watch the movie, by the way. <laughs> but if it be possible, so what's suggested even in that statement? Choices. It's not possible. It, it's it's not not possible. You know, the, and he says it this way. He says, if it be possible, as much as lie in you. Now, that will connect with what Dave just preached earlier about what Paul says to Philemon the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you, which is in Christ Jesus, right? So, if it be possible, as much as lies in you, well, who lies in you? How much lies in you? Let's say that the level of your understanding is just the book of Romans. That's not necessarily a bad thing or a good thing. It just, let's just say it is. So, let's say you don't really grasp Ephesians yet, because maybe you've never read it or been taught or Philippians or Colossians. Let's say it's the level of the book, the book of Romans. So do you at that point have the full level of all the word of God about everybody yet built into your soul? You don't? No. no. So therefore, you're not going to have some information that might help in dealing with particular issues that you might gain from Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians. But you still have information, don't you? Mm -hmm. So when that verse says this, it says, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you. In this very book of Romans, look with me to Romans 14.1. I'm already getting into the meat of my message, and I want to get back to chapter 12, verse 22 in a moment. But watch this. Look at 14.1. Look 14.1. At 14, 1. 14 1, Romans 14.1. Him that is what? Weak in the faith. Look at 15.1. We that are what? Strong. See that? You see in the context there, there are always going to be those who are weak in the faith and those who are strong in the faith. Those who are weak in an understanding of Pauline doctrine. For, it could be for a number of reasons. Maybe it just got exposed to right division two months ago or one year ago. Right? So if, if you just got exposed to right division maybe just less than a year ago compared to someone who maybe was exposed to and has been studying right division for 20 years, is your level of understanding going to be different than yes. that other person? Yes. Sure is. That, that's not a bad thing or a good thing. It just is. Right. Now, on the other hand, if you were exposed to right division 20 years ago and you're at a Galatians level, that's, can I say, in a gracious, that, yeah, that's not so good. <laughs> Did that make sense why I said that? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so my point is that at any given time, in any group of people, you might be either the weaker or the stronger brother. Understand why? In any setting, depending on your understanding, your grasp, and, and letting the Word of God work in you, in any particular setting, because the people that are there are different each time and so forth, you could wind up being either the weaker or the wrong, the strong brother. That's not necessarily a good thing, thing or bad thing. It's just it's so be aware of it. We're, we're all at different places in our understanding, <coughs> pardon me, not only of the Bible issue, of the grace message, things like that. And we all are wanting to continue to what? Grow and be edified. Okay? So when he says back in chapter uh, 12 there, look back at chapter number 12, he says at verse 18, 12, 18, he says, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Now that verse, that's a direct statement. 
But you see how in the statement, it indicates that, you know what? Not everyone is going to come to the same conclusion and decision based upon the same circumstance. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense how I said that? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it takes some discernment. And in Paul's epistles, there are a lot of statements like this. Yeah, I know, a lot of discernment. A lot of statements, and we're going to look at several of these. Um, so, with that in mind, now if you would go back to Romans 12, I'm going to—I'd like—I'm going to have you write a couple of other words or phrases down. I'll do this kind of quickly, and then we're going to dive into some specific places where Paul, where we see how Paul's thinking process. Look at verse one. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. Which is your okay? Now, what's the word? Reason to write that one down. Okay, so emphasizing the word reasonable. Let's momentarily think about it. the word reasonable. There's two words. What are the two words? Reason. Isn't that interesting? What is? What are those two words? I, who, who was it that was talking about comfort the feeble-minded? Was that you? Yeah. So, how many of us? Anyway, so. <laughs> we're, I remember years ago we were talking with, with one of the ladies at church, and, and I think she was having a hard time with what I was saying. It was probably me and everything. And she said, John, the verse says comfort the feeble-minded, you know? <laughs> and uh, so, but I, I say that kind of jokingly, but when that verse says reasonable, reason, able, able to reason, so, so what's implied in the very word about service? Mm -hmm. You're able to figure it out. Figure it out. Able to, to reason. It out. So service, it's not, you're not a robot, not, right. uh, not mm -hmm. automaton. Right? Yeah. You're not C3PO, right? Okay, Lord, I'm mm -hmm. going to do this. I got to put myself in there. They didn't know what yellow faces were. They don't. Y'all know what C three PO was. That's kind of funny, but so so service is to be out of reason, reasoning through things, right? Okay, so that's word number one. Now look at verse two. I think David mentioned this on Friday, I believe. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the what? Renewing. Okay, so now we've got renewing. Renewing of what? Mind. 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 Okay, see that there? What does the word renewing mean? Ongoing. On, yeah, ongoing what? I mean new. new. What's that? New. Yeah, make, renew. New. Making new the mind again. But how many of us would like a new mind, okay? okay. Yeah, definitely. So, so, how do we renew the mind? What renews the mind? The it's got to be the Word of God, and then we, we read it, we compare what it says, verse to verse, we interact, we talk with each other, we get insight here about this verse. So we're letting the Word of God renew the mind, okay? Uh, next, what I'd like you to do is turn over to 1 Corinthians 6, 1 Corinthians 6. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 12. Look at, look at 6, 12. He says this. All things are lawful <coughs> to me, but all things are not what? Expedient. 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 Before we move on, let me read the definition of the word expedient. Because sometimes we have, um, or can have, a, a wrong definition, a wrong understanding of the word. Expedient, here's what it means. It means suitable for achieving a particular end in a given circumstance. So does it sound like the word expedient, in and of itself, does it define does it define whether the thing being considered is good or bad in and of itself? No. It doesn't, does it? 
the word means that you, you, something that's suitable for achieving a particular end in a given circumstance. We were kind of joking about politics yesterday. We, uh -huh. we will all understand it. Oftentimes you'll, people say, well, the politician is just making a choice that is expedient to get elected, and then they change their mind and yeah. do the opposite right. of what they said. So in that kind of a context, the word expedient, it, it doesn't change the definition of the word, but it's describing the outcome that a particular choice make, a person makes, right? You can have you can pay to have the package expedited. Expedited, excellent. That's an oh, interesting connection, isn't there? That yeah. Expedited. Yeah. Now look at that verse again. He says, "All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any." Now think about that there. So in the dispensation of grace, is it a true statement? And as a believer, you can live any way you want to live. Mm -hmm. By the way, you're doing that anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but in the dispensation of grace, is it a true statement that you really can just live any way you want to live? Is that true? Yes. 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 That's a true statement. But should we? No. no. Or why would you? And why would you? That would be That's a great question. Both of us. So when the Apostle Paul says there, that something... All things are lawful. Yeah. I can do, you can do anything. But just because you can do anything, that doesn't mean that we should do anything that we can't do. Not all things are expedient. Not all things are suitable to achieve the desired end in the particular circumstance. So now we're focusing on the desired end. Well, what, what am I going to get out of this? What's, what's the goal? You see the idea there? And he says, and I will not be brought under the power right. of any. So when it comes to expediency, we have to realize that the choices that we make, they're going to lead to a desired end, but they also have a power to them. And do I want to give myself to that power? You see the picture there? He says it in a different way in chapter 10. Look over to chapter 10, verse 23 and 24. Chapter 10, verse 23 and 24. 10, verse 23 and 24. He says this. I hope you have, will have these marked in your Bible. At least write down these references. They're really good. He says, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. So, oh. so, so, so not all things will accomplish and lead to and produce the, the appropriate desired end in the appropriate circumstance. Did you ever see that there? Oh. So that was 1 Corinthians 10, 23. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things what? Yeah. Ah, so now when he talks about the principle of expedient or expediency, there's the sense of the power that will come as a result of what I'm choosing to do. There's a question of whether or not it will edify whether or not it will get, everybody see that there? But all things edify not. Mm -hmm. So even though I can do some things and it will have, it will produce a certain thing, mm -hmm. if it's not going to edify, then I'll make a different choice. You see, you see the idea there? And then he goes on to say, watch verse 23 again, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all, th but all things what? So in the question I need to ask myself, when I make this choice, is it going to result in my edification spiritually or my destruction spiritually? You see, we're looking at the potential outcome. Everybody, okay. But look at the next verse, because he think, he, he's thinking about just beyond himself. Let no man seek his own, the sense of his own just limited outcome, edification or not. But every man, another's what? Well, well. Okay, time to pass the plate. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, I thought that would get a bigger reaction. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. The word wealth in that verse is not, you know, everybody send me your Bitcoin. That's not the point. <laughs> the word wealth in that it is the, your spiritual wealth. So those two verses, Paul is saying, when I'm going to make a decision, I want to use the principle of expediency, that is, 
We're looking for a desired outcome in a particular circumstance such that I don't give power to something that's going to destroy me. Instead, something that's going to edify me and also edify others. See that? You, you see what's happening here? It never really affects the family. It doesn't. It, it does. We're, and we're going to talk in a moment about the family, about how to how to work, in, work through some things. Okay, so, um, all right, so now if you would go to Philippians chapter number two. What, what I'm doing here, I'm writing principles now. Okay, I'm, I'm giving you principles here. And then we're going to see some examples of how Paul implemented these. Look at Philippians chapter uh, three here, Philippians three. Look at Philippians 3. Now, in the context of Philippians uh, 3, the Apostle Paul is, is describing this, this personal, man, personal walk of faith. He, he, he says, you see at the end of verse 8, the end of verse 8, he says that I may reign in Christ. You see the Philippians 3, 8? Yes. Ever see that there? Yeah. Yes. Can you win Christ? Yeah, or so. Don't you already have him? Right. Yeah. Did Paul already have him? Yes. yes. Then why did he say that I may win Christ? So can you win Christ? Everybody say yes. Yeah. Yes. Right there. Yeah. So how do you win Christ? Well, how do you win Christ? We're talking about decision making, right? By being obedient. By being led of the Spirit. You, you, you win Christ. Read the next verse. Moment by moment by moment. Let me, let me ask it this way. There's a funny joke that says, do you wake up grumpy? grumpy? No, I let him sleep every morning. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so, when you, when, oh, John liked that one. <laughs> Just come back to me. Yeah, no, no, no. So, but, so th this kind of a concept here. Let's say you woke up the first thing out of your mouth. Well, oh, man. It's conference weekend. We gotta we'll listen to Dave and John, and I'm just tired of listening to those guys and everything. But let's go put on a smile face. Yeah. No, you didn't win Christ. <laughs> you could have, right? I'm saying this. The idea to win Christ is that I can win him right now. How? Well, how about rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerned. You just won Christ right there. The idea of winning Christ isn't the idea that we'll finally have the judgment seat of Christ. Now, Paul says that. He's talking about right then, right sure. there in his life. You can win Christ every single day. You win him. We're in the battle. We're in the warfare every day. Win Christ. Let Christ be our life. Let him be our sufficiency. And you win him right there. And you win him right there. That's and you win him again. It's the experiencing of not I, but Christ. He goes on to say, the way he describes it is verse 9, and be found in him. Well, I thought he was in him. Is he? Yep. Are you? Yep. Well, then why would he say that I may be found in him? Not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the, the faith of Christ, the righteousness of God by faith, that I'm in him. I thought he already knew Christ. He's written many books by this point. He's been saved 30 years. And he says, and I may know him. He's expressing, describing his heart desire as a believer to experience the living Lord Jesus Christ every day, every moment in his life as he goes through life. Yeah, to win him on a daily basis. To be found operating out of him as my resource instead of out of self as my resource. Mm -hmm. To be found, you said, to be found in him. If, I, if I'm called, it's like he's saying, if I'm called at the judgment seat of Christ this moment, I want to be found at this moment to be functioning out of Christ as my life. That's right. He goes, got, just because of time's sake, i got to move on here, but look at verse 11. If by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. Well, he's going to get, he's going to get caught up with the rapture. So that verse is not about the rapture. The resurrection of the dead is Christ has been raised from the dead. He says, if by any means, I want to be found living out of the resource of the resurrected Jesus Christ right here, right now in my life. Right here, right now. Now he says this. 
Not as though I had already attained, now they were already perfect. Wow. What chance did we have? <laughs> right. Paul's been saved 30 years at this point, written all these books, experienced all these things, and he says, now they're already perfect, but I follow after. Watch, he's pursuing, but I follow, he's pursuing. But I follow after if that I, now watch very carefully. But I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which I was apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brother, I can't. Okay, why didn't you stop me? I did not read that verse correct. I did it. By the way, we, we preachers often read verses incorrectly, sometimes on purpose, oftentimes because we're not paying attention to the words. Yes. And that's on us. That's wrong on us. Especially if us that keep saying every word of God matters. The verses matter. Yeah. So we got to be more careful about that. But I read that verse wrong on purpose. You see, we're paying attention. Look. Yeah. <laughs> that's what he said. What's the difference with... The last part of that verse, it says, but I follow after, middle of the verse, right there, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I was, no. No. I also, not which I am, you change the tense, apprehended. What's the difference between if Paul said that for which I was apprehended of Christ, he is compared to the fact that he says that for which I am apprehended. Paul in this passage is not talking about an event that happened only and exclusively in isolated to Acts 9, the conversion of the world to the masses. He said, every day I'm going to let Christ get a hold of me because my flesh wants to run away. Right. Every day I've got to let the doctrine grip me again because there's this battle in my flesh. And sometimes we think we have a battle in the flesh. I have not suffered shipwreck three times. I've never been beaten with rods. I've never been stoned with stones and so forth. I've, I've never been whipped with lashes. If there's anyone that has a reason and grounds to say, Lord, okay, okay, what's in the wrestling they call tap out? Yeah. If there's anyone that's like, hey, Lord, get, you know, on the ground, tapping out, tapping out. I'm uncle, there would have been anything to say that. He said, man, I, I want to be found in him. I, I want to get a hold again of why he continues to get a hold of me. I am that. He doesn't say I was. And he was apprehended. But in that verse it says that I am apprehended. The ongoing desire. And, and describing, you're talking about the battle, right? This flesh, that ongoing battle. The flesh is so ready to say enough. And the more we see the doctrine and the love of God, we say, wow, I need more. Yeah. yeah. And the more we say, wow, I need more, the flesh says, no, you don't. <laughs> and the doctrine says, well, yes, you do. The love of God says, come with me. The flesh says, well, you've taken me far enough, <laughs> right? Now, I say all that to say this. Keep reading. Verse 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. All the things he described about his religious background, verse yeah. 4, 5, 6, 7, all, all, all that he had. He says, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth into those things which are, are, are before, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God. It's a heavenly calling, right? I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So in our context here, what is it? It is all... Comfortable with where he was at? No. 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 Is he pressing forward? Yes. yes. Pressing forward. Why and for what purpose? Isn't he pressing forward for the purpose of learning more each and every day about how the doctrine, how the truth, how Christ in him is able to function and will function in him? The depth of understanding the wonderful grace of God. Yes. He wants to understand more, a little bit every day, a little bit more every day, a little bit more every day. You see, see how he's pressing that? Would you say that at the time that Paul wrote this book, spiritually, he was kind of advanced? Sure. Yes, no? Yeah. Sure. Was yeah. he maybe further advanced than the Corinthians? Maybe yes. further no. advanced than the Thessalonians? He's kind yeah. of advanced, right? Yeah. Would you say also that in the Church of the Body of Christ, that were there were others who maybe were at his level of understanding, and maybe some higher, and maybe some not quite so much. I don't mean that in a negative way at all. My point is, you see how in the body of Christ, there are, people are going to be at different levels of understanding. Right. So now watch what he says. 15. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. What minded? Just 
press on. Keep understanding more. Keep your heart open to understanding and learning more. He says, let us therefore as many as be perfectly thus minded, and if anything, and if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Now here it is, verse 16. Here's why I went to the whole this whole section. <laughs> Nevertheless, where to we have already been? Whatever level of spiritual perception and understanding that you are at right now, right today, what's today's date? The 22nd? The 22nd, what year? 2024? Is it October? No. Is it September? September. 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 Whatever today's date is. <laughs> Whatever <laughs> level of spiritual grasp and appreciation and understanding that you're at right now, verse 16, nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us mind the same rule. What rule? Let us walk by the same rule. What rule? To press towards the mark. Let us mind the same thing. What thing? The thing that Paul put his mind on. To apprehend that for which he is being apprehended. You see, I'm saying in that verse, you see what the, the principle that the Apostle Paul is describing as the level of maturity. You see it? You see it in the verse there? Let me ask it a different way. When you got saved, but let me say it differently. Based upon your level of understanding, the Word of God is divided right now, and your King James Bible. Are you now at a place in your life to make a different and likely a better decision than you would have made a week after you even became a believer in the first place. Sure. Yeah. 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 Hopefully. Okay, growth. First, the scripture, growth. Now, sir, and then experience. Yeah, they all say, we all learn more from our bad choices. <laughs> you know, so the point is, right there, the level of maturity. We're going to make a decision based upon where we are in our spiritual understanding at that time. So, as I mentioned earlier, the weaker brother principle, the stronger brother principle. In any given situation and setting, we could be either to turn out we're the weaker brother, and we need others to come and be patient with us, or we are the stronger brother, we need to be patient with others in any given setting. Right there? Okay? One more. When I say one more, I don't mean only, no, no, no. That clock doesn't exist on that wall. That's the thing. <laughs> it's not there. He's got the remote. Yeah, we don't know how to read it anymore. Yeah, we don't know how to read it anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Time's on my. my. My wife sometimes early in the morning, she'll I'll get up and everything, and she'll say what time it is, and I'll, you know, I'll I'll, I'll say like two o'clock in the morning. She said, No, it's not. <laughs> well, somewhere. <laughs> well, John, John, in the very chat so you're in. Somewhere that clock does not. Somewhere the time is not. I think <laughs> is so I'm going to go find the time somewhere else. Where did I, did I say to go? Second, Second Timothy two, real quick. Second Timothy chapter number two. Second Timothy two, and there's a little phrase here. A little phrase here. And here's what it is. Second Timothy two seven. Watch this. Consider what I say. You see 2 Timothy 2, 7? Mm -hmm. Consider what I say, and the Lord gives the understanding in all things. So the last thing we're going to, in terms of these principles, we have to consider what Paul oh. says. That's true, but why? Why would why would why would we consider what Paul says? He's the apostle of the Gentiles. He's the apostle of the Gentiles. Right. Who gave him the information? Yeah. The, Lord the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Yeah. So what we're doing is we're gonna when we're seeking to make a decision, we're gonna appeal to the word of God rightly divided. Should we in making our decisions pertaining to the dispensation of grace, should we consider what Moses says? No. No. no, no. It was kind of a trick question. Yeah. yeah. No. Paul says, consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding of all things. Yeah. Right. Okay. So in Paul's oh. epistles, Paul tells us how to understand the whole Bible. 
Moses tells so, us who created the earth. What's that? Moses tells us who Moses created. Moses tells us tells us who created the earth. So we should we consider that. So you see the idea there? It, it, don't you hate it when Grace preachers? Why don't you consider? You take into account all the word of God, but where we are in the word of God. Okay, now. Can I impose upon that I need at least 10 minutes? That's yeah, okay. okay. Can we go no, for at least five minutes after? Um, remember, Al, I chided the dear sister that was talking about bargaining with God, but I couldn't <laughs> bargain with you. <laughs> okay, so let's look at some verses. What we're going to do is in Paul's epistles, we're going to observe his decision making process. That's all we're going to do. <clears throat> and we're going to seek to gain some insight from his decision making process. Uh, look with me at 1 Thessalonians 3. Because of time, we're, we're, we're not going to be able to get into all the context of all these statements. But look at 1 Thessalonians 3. Here, when Paul wrote this book, he found himself in a situation where he had been run out of Thessalonica. He made multiple attempts to get back in, but, but couldn't because of the adversary. So what he does, he sends Timotheus in to help him. But look how he says it. Look in 1 Thessalonians 3, watch verse 1. 1 Thessalonians 3, 1. Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, that is, forbear to find out how the Thessalonians were doing. He was really concerned about them. He says, wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and so forth. How did Paul make the decision? He, he, he's in Athens. He's been trying to get back to the Thessalonians, but he can't. So he sends Timotheus. How did he make that decision? Did he say, God told me? He thought did he it say, through. God spoke to me? No. He thought it through. He thought it through. He used his reason... He renewed his mind with the doctrine. He knew the Thessalonians needed the continued edification. When he says later on, to perfect that which is lacking in your faith, that phrase is, is not a derogatory comment about them. That which was lacking in their faith had to do with the amount of doctrine that, that they had been given, and there was more they needed. He wasn't cutting them down. So, And then he makes a decision based upon the expediency principle is that he can't get in. He wants to make sure that the, that the Thessalonians are going to continue to be edified. So he knew his level of maturity. He knew their level of maturity. He knew Timothy's level of maturity. He knew Timothy was the one to send them in to send in to them to help them continue in the faith and so forth. And so now what we can do is we say, wow, you see how Paul made a decision right there? He didn't wait for God to you know, part the skies and so forth and say, Paul, do this. Paul functioned in the light of the sound doctrine committed to his trust, his level of understanding, his awareness of the spiritual battle that he was in and why he couldn't get back to them, but Timothy's ability to, to, to continue the edification process so he sins and when he says we there, who's the we? Well, you've got, you've got Paul, you've got Sylvanus, you've got the three of them discussed it. He said, here's, here's the situation. How do, how do we get back to them? How do we help them in the education process? Isn't that amazing? Uh, isn't that kind of cool? Yeah. How you see that right there? Yeah. Look at another one. And because of time, we're not going to be able to look into all of these, but look over to, uh, David mentioned this, I believe, Friday night. Look over to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. Look at this one, it's very interesting. Paul had told them in 1 Corinthians 
that he was going to get wanted to get back to them. And for various reasons, he has not gone there yet. So some people accused Paul of being disingenuous regarding his love and care for them. And so in this book, when he starts this book, he actually conveys to them why he hasn't come yet. Look how he says it. 2 Corinthians 2. 2 Corinthians 2. In fact, look, look at chapter 1, 23. Start at verse 23, we'll, we will read in the chapter 2. So look at this. So uh, 2 Corinthians 1, 23. He says this, Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul. So he, he, he asked God to be his witness here. Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul that to spare you I came not as yet unto Corinth, not for that we have dominion over your faith, for the helpers of your joy, for by faith you stand... But I determine this with who? Myself. I determine this with myself, that I would not come again to you in heaviness. For if I make you sorry, who is he then that maketh me glad but the same which is made? So let me keep reading. Look, look, at, look, at, look at. He says in verse 3, And I wrote this same unto you, lest when I came, I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears. I thought so, you should excuse be, me, where are we? That was verse 4, 2 Corinthians 2, 4. Yeah. Oh, 2, okay. Did it, everybody else did it? Yeah. yeah. So look at, look, look back at verse 4. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears. Not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. Uh, think about that verse. Imagine when they got 1 Corinthians. It was stained, but not with blood. It was stained with Paul's tears. And even when he's writing this book, he says, I wrote out of many tears. When he made the decision not to go to the Corinthians at this point, he says, I determined this with myself. He doesn't say God told me not to go, or he doesn't say God told me to go. He doesn't say it that way. He said, in the light of where you guys were spiritually in your reception of the information and the fact that you were going off into human viewpoint, I didn't want to come and be presently with you and have to call everybody out, as they say, and point out all these, these things. So instead, he sent this letter ahead of time. He sent 2 Corinthians ahead of time to allow this letter to be Paul in their presence mm -hmm. and to allow this letter to stir up their heart and bring a positive response to the doctor. But he says, I determined this with myself. Do you know what that's all about? The principle of reasonable service, renewed his own mind, and also he was aware of where the Corinthians were, so the principle of expediency for others and so forth. His level of understanding and their level of understanding, and then he tells us how he thought this through. Isn't that interesting here? Yeah. Um, in this same chapter, look, look at something else. Thinking it through these, this way, this will really bring to light a bunch of statements that he makes in his epistles. Here's another one. Look at verse 12. And I've got to move much more quickly here. So look at verse 12. He says, furthermore, verse 12, furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened in the name of the Lord. That sounds pretty good, right? How many of us wouldn't be excited about that? You know? But look at what he says. He, he says, I had no rest in my spirit. Why? Because I found not Titus my brother. But taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. Well, that's one debated couple of verses. People often go to those verses and say, Paul right there was out of the will of God. There was a great door open, and Paul left and ran from it, is what people say. They completely missed the point. Paul had dispatched Titus to the Corinthians 
and they had prearranged that Titus and he would meet at Troas. And when Paul got to Troas, Titus wasn't there. Now, what kind of questions do you think might have entered into Paul's mind about what done happened? What did the Corinthians do to Titus? <laughs> By the way, Titus was a tough dude. I mean, <laughs> and so forth, you know? <laughs> But, but Titus wasn't there, so what happened to him? Remember, the, remember when he talks about Epaphroditus and he, he was, was sick for the of nine to the Lord from the Philippians and so forth? Well, did, did Titus die? Did the Corinthians tar and feather him? What happened to the guy? So Paul's overwhelming concern about Titus, he thought through the situation. He was aware that there were others at Troas that could respond and effectively deal with the open door of the gospel and so forth. He says, okay, I'm going to leave you guys here. I gotta go find Titus. Oh, he picks this up in chapter seven and explains what happens. This isn't that kind of amazing. But here he says, and I thought it good. If you would look look over to chapter nine, verse five. Look over to chapter nine and verse five. Similar idea. Because of time's sake, again, we're not. Uh, let me just point the verses out, and you and your own study time go back and kind of think through with Paul his thinking process. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 5. Therefore, God told me it was necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go. Oh. He didn't say it. He, he, he doesn't use the terminology that uh, they call it Christian ease. Yeah. <laughs> he just, that's not the terminology he uses. You see in that verse, he says, Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren, and so on. He's thinking through various circumstances, making decisions that are expedient that will impact his own edification and that of others. Look at 2 Corinthians. This is a real interesting one. Actually, 1 Corinthians 16. Watch this now. 1 Corinthians 16. 1 Corinthians 16. 1 Corinthians 16, watch verse 12. 1 Corinthians 16, 12. 1 Corinthians 16, 12, pardon me. Watch this. This is a real this yeah. is interesting here. Yeah, yeah. 1 Corinthians 16. 1 Corinthians 16, 12. 1 Corinthians 16, 12. He says, as touching our brother Apollos, now, go back and study about Apollos. By this point, Apollos had come to understand the revelation of the mystery and was, was teaching it and was standing for it. But he says this, As touching our brother Apollos, I greatly desired him to come unto you with the brethren, but God's will was not at all that he come unto you. Isn't that interesting? It says, but his will was not at all to come. Well, does that mean that Apollos was out of the will of God? Does that mean that Paul was out of the will of God for greatly desiring for Apollos to go? It doesn't mean any of that. It means you have these two brothers. They're discussing a situation. Paul is expressing his great desire that Apollos would go back, and there's a lot of background so forth as to why. But Apollos said, you know, it, it uh, it's not going to help the situation if I go back right now. In fact, it goes on to say, but he will come when he shall have convenient time. So there's something else going on that Apollos felt more pressing about compared to going to the Corinthians at this moment. Are you seeing this? Think about, yeah. think about the difference between that and when he would, had his discussion with John Mark. Wow, yeah, say it loud. See what you said. Same with the, this, this, the difference between this discussion with Apollos and the one he had with John Mark that didn't go well. It didn't go well. The, 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 the argument between him and Barnabas and John Mark compared to this one right here. Isn't that interesting? Okay, let's quickly move on and look at some others. So that, that's excellent there. Look, okay, let me just write these two verses down. In Ephesians 4, Ephesians 4, it says, verse 11, and he gave some apostles and prophets and so forth, evangelists, mm -hmm. pastors, teachers. That's the supernatural divine giving, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But in 1 Timothy 3, 1, it says, If any man desire the office mm -hmm. of a bishop, he desires a good, good work. Yeah. Huh. Are those verses saying the same thing? Mm -hmm. 
In the passage in Ephesians, God supernaturally, divinely gave the pastor teacher. But by the time he writes Timothy there, he says, if any man desire the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. God is not supernaturally directly giving pastors, teachers to this, or evangelists for that matter. Well then, how is it that we made such a fair decision to become a pastor? Jerry <laughs> 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 said more ago, I'm not going that. that, that. <laughs> because the doctrine working in us, any one of us, you make a conscious choice wherever you want to be to minister, take the doctrine for you and for others. Some may be a pastor, some elders, some, and there's all kinds of positions and needs in the body of Christ. Amen. You're not falling short if you're not making a decision to be a pastor or elder and so forth. There are plenty of positions and responsible positions in the body of Christ. And what you do is, in the light of the sound doctrine, you let the doctrine produce, bring forth a desire to serve in that capacity. Does that make sense? Isn't that interesting one right there? Look at just a couple more here. Um, look at Titus 3. Titus 3. Titus 3. And Philemon. And, and we'll, we'll wrap it up here with a quick summary. Look at Titus 3. Look at Titus 3, 12. Titus 3, 12. Titus 3, 12. He says this. When I shall send Artemis unto thee, or Tychicus. So at the time he wrote this, has he decided yet? No. Why hasn't he decided yet? Well, because God didn't tell him yet. No! I was hoping to get a real big no on that. <laughs> the reason he hasn't decided yet is not because God did or didn't tell him. He just he didn't have all the information yet. He just didn't know what's going to be available. What was that? Didn't know who was be available. Yeah, he didn't know who would be available at the time. It says, When I shall send Artemis unto thee, or teach you this, be diligent to come unto me to Nicopolis, for, for God told me, to winter there. No. 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 I determined. What, what's it say? I it says, determined. I determined there to winter. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So, what you see him, look, look over to Philemon. Next, of course, it's one, one book over. This is a fascinating one. Dave mentioned earlier about right. the book of Philemon here. Right. Onesimus apparently steals something. Mm -hmm. Philemon runs away. He gets captured is in bonds. How would you like to be put in bonds right next to the Apostle Paul? <laughs> <laughs> you, not, you don't have a chance of not getting saved. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, he gets saved. Yeah. And as Paul is thinking about, okay, what do I do with this guy? Because <laughs> technically, he, he belongs to Philemon. Let's see his thinking. So in Philemon, Look at verse uh, 8. He says, Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee with that which is convenient, yet for love's sake. Wow, isn't that how grace appeals? Doesn't it appeal to us for love's sake? Yes. I rather beseech thee. Not command me. But he adds, being such as one, as Paul the what? Why does he say that? Isn't he the one that the Lord Jesus Christ gave all the doctrine to? Yeah. Yeah. And he's got a little bit of experience in the doctrine in his life at this point. He didn't just get converted. Right. He's got 30 years or so forth discovering, finding out whether or not the grace of God really is sufficient, whether or not the doctrine works, whether or not to appeal to Philemon on the basis of I command you mm -hmm. or I beseech you. See the difference there? Mm -hmm. He says, yet for love's sake, I beseech thee. He says here, verse 9, yet for love's sake, I rather beseech thee, being what such an one as Paul the aged, oh, all the experience, mm -hmm. including the scars, and now a prisoner of Jesus Christ. The opposition never stops. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in time past was to be unprofitable. So he was an unprofitable servant. There's a lot going on in his name, by the way. But now, profitable to thee and to me, 
whom I have sent again, now therefore receive him that is mine own vows, whom I would have retained with me, that in my stead, there's the doctrine of substitution, he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. I have a question for you. Do you think that Paul could have used a close, dear friend while Paul himself was in bonds in Rome? Yes. He led this man to the Lord, completely changed this guy's outlook about life and everything. Was And this man was ministering to the apostle Paul in bonds. And Paul is saying, wow, I sure would have liked to have kept him. Yeah. You know but he thought it through, and he says, Onesimus, you know what? You should go back. You need to talk with Philemon because under Roman law, you're actually his. Now, Onesimus could have said, but no, I have my rights. Yeah. I, I this, I that, I just. Onesimus doesn't do any of that. Paul pins this letter, and you know who he sends it to Philemon in whose hands he entrusts it. He sent this letter to become scripture as part of your Bible. He puts it in the hands, in the trusted hands of someone who before was untrustworthy. He writes this letter, and he says, oh, listen, let's just go ahead and go back. And you let Onesimus decide by that. Go ahead and go back. And, and just give this letter to my dear and our dear brother Philemon. Your, your, your owner. Imagine that what that must have been like. Philemon has got a group in his home. They're having Bible study. About. The bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. The acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. And there's a knock on the door. And Philemon, oh, everybody's here already. <laughs> is that Rome coming to shut us down? Who is that? So he says, okay, just wait. He goes to the door. He opens the door. And who's standing there? Oh, yes, Mr. Stanley. Completely different countenance of on his face. Imagine the first initial thought and reaction of each of them as they looked upon each other. <laughs> and he says, here's a letter from Paul. So, well, even kind of on the spot now. Okay? <laughs> so, he opens this letter. He would read through the letter and now what is he going to do? Mm -hmm. yeah. at, at the entrance is this unprofitable servant. And everybody in his local assembly, including also the other servants, knew this guy apparently stole something and ran away. Don't trust that guy. Uh, and now he's standing at the door. He's got, and and Philemon's got this letter from Paul. So all the saints are, what are they doing? They're watching. That's right. Uh -huh. what's, gonna, what's he going to do? Philemon at this point is the one that read the letter. They don't know what it says. And then as he takes and reads the letter, and it says this, verse 13, but he says, whom I would have retained with me that in my stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel, but without thy mind would I do what? Nothing. You see what he just did with Philemon here? In the presence of the people at his house that were at church, in the presence of Onesimus, he's saying, Philemon, I'm going to let you decide. The next choice is yours. You decide. How you're going to receive him, whether or not you're going to receive him. He says, but without thy mind I would do nothing that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but what? Willingly. What's the difference between those two? Not of necessity, but willingly. Wanting. 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 I want you to make a decision, not of necessity, 
of will of your own free will. He says this now. He says, verse 15, for perhaps, isn't that an interesting way to say it? He doesn't say God for ordained all this. He says, for perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him forever, not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord, if thou count me therefore a partner, and did Philemon count Paul as a partner, yes, then therefore receive him as myself. Well, what conveying, what evidence, what manifestation of the doctrines of Christ, God received us as Christ to himself. He says, if, if he hath wronged thee, or owed thee, or, and have any of us wronged God? And yet that verse says, put that on my account. All wrong was put to the account of Jesus Christ, and we benefited. And he says, I, verse 19, I, Paul, have written it with my own hand. I will repay. And it was in the blood of Jesus Christ that all wronging of God was written down and paid for. Eternally etched in the scriptures. For all eternity to witness and see. I, Paul, have written with mine own hand, I will repay it. I'll be I do not say to thee how thou oughtest un, uh, owest unto me, even thine own self. Now watch verse 20 and 21. Yea, brother, let me have joy in thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels. Well, how by receiving Onesimus as a brother. He says, having confidence in thy obedience. Paul had confidence in the level of the doctrines of grace functioning in Philemon. And he knew that Philemon would function based upon that sound doctrine that he saw. And he says this, having confidence in, the, uh, having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do what? More than I say. More than I say. Paul understood that the level of sound doctrine functioning in Philemon was going to bring Philemon not just to the place where he would accept Onesimus back, but that he would do with Onesimus what God did with Philemon. God set Philemon free. Philemon's going to set Onesimus free. He's going to do more than he says. You see that there? Wow, yeah. It's abounding in love. You see that? Abounding in love. Abounding in love. Now, through any of this, it's interesting that the way that Paul talks about this, he doesn't say, God told me to do this, God told you to do that. God gave me a son. That's not how he describes either his thinking process or what he expected Philemon's thinking process to be. For that, that matter, even on the, uh, of Onesimus. By the way, you think about Onesimus. What must, how uncomfortable might it have been for him yeah, right, to insane. walk back into that home church? Right. Everybody knew him. Right. Right? What am I saying? I'm saying that how do we make decisions in line with the will of God when the specific instructions aren't necessarily given? Well, we know we live in the dispensation of grace. God's forming the church of the body of Christ. His will is all men to be saved and saved to be edified. He wants us to be built up in the doctrine. He wants us to rejoice in who we are in Christ. Pray without ceasing and everything give thanks. Those things that he made very clear, let's, let, let's not be involved in idolatry. Let's not be involved in fornication. We, there's a better way to live life. Better choices. And in those areas where he has not specifically said to do or not to do certain things, we can see in Paul's epistles his thinking process. He it was a service based on reason, so he had to think things through. He let the scriptures be the source of renewing his mind. Mm -hmm. He made a decision that was expedient, which maybe a year later it might have been a different decision because the circumstance might have been different. And then based upon his level of understanding and the level and the need of those that, in relationship to the decision that was to be made, he made a choice. And so we consider that. 
in our decision-making process. If you find yourself right now in a real troubling situation, maybe oftentimes it's about family and children, what do you do? Well, as, as maybe simple and silly as this might be, begin just by, with a piece of paper, write down your possible options. I'm, this is real practical. Just write down your possible options. Okay, I, I could do this, I could do this. And even if you're not sure what your options are, just write down some options. Just, just begin to let, let it come out. Write down those options. In the light of the possible options that you wrote down for that decision that you're needing to make, then the old checklist, pros and cons. Yeah. If I if I make this decision, what's the possible desire and outcome? If I make this decision, okay, this could possibly happen. The, the cons are, well, boy, if I do this, it's going to drive me further away. If I do this, it's, it seems like it's just going to close the door even more. You're going to make your checklist. And based upon, you see, you're thinking this through. In the light of sound doctrine, that you're in a relationship with Abba Father. So you're talking to the Father about this, you're praying without ceasing to the whole thing. Then what you do is you, you make a decision. Sometimes the best decision is at the moment, no decision. Do you know that? Yeah. Because maybe you just don't have all the information yet. Sometimes you make the decision and then some things come to the surface, whatever, a few months later and you realize, okay, that didn't quite work out like I thought. You know? <laughs> so what do you do then? You just simply reevaluate. Because life is, they say that the constant thing about life is change. So maybe things change. Maybe the person you were trying to reach, maybe they responded positively. Well, then that might then therefore affect your next step. Maybe they responded negatively. So that too will possibly affect the next decision. You make. Is that there? Yeah. It's just an ongoing walk of faith in who we are in Christ in this wonderful relationship described by Abba Father. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for the time to be able to look into your word this, this whole weekend and talk further about decision making in the light of your will. And we ask that as we have spent the weekend doing this, that each and every one of us might have gotten e even a, some a little thing, maybe big things, but even something for every one of us regarding our relationship to you as our Abba Father and how to just talk with you on a regular basis and hear your counsel from Scripture regarding whatever the particular decision is. And we'll thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, dear.